Well, this morning it is an honor. I want to just share with you really quick. We have with us our special guest, Terry and Sue Thurston. And we've introduced them for the last week or so as missionaries to China. They are that, but they are also much more. They, As we begin to uh, learn about their uh, mission, about their work, about their ministry, we've, we're finding that they're actually missionaries to the world. I mean, in many ways, they're, they're missionaries to many, many nations. Uh, probably be hearing some about that. Uh, primarily, though, in China. And as you know, and as we watched the video last week uh, from, from, uh, from China, they are overseers of churches in underground China as well. Um, and so just doing a phenomenal work. They're very, very precious folks. It is truly an honor to have them this morning. Um, but a really cool side story. Didn't know this um, when we met. Didn't know this as we were connected. Our connection was uh, one of our spiritual overseers, uh, Pastor Doug Combs, introduced us actually. And I didn't know that they had such a rich heritage and connection with Rick Clendenin, right? Of course, our spiritual father and overseer for us, and Dale Yurton. And so very connected with them and then found out that they actually attend church with a pastor who I'm very close friends with and just, just didn't know. So we just feel close. We just feel really connected and united. That's how God works. Amen. And so really quick, just give them a big hand. Let them know we welcome them so much. It's an honor to have them. If we could all go back to 2018, that would be great, wouldn't it? Before the world went crazy. Uh, we were going back and forth to China every two months. Four times a year we were in our mainland, and we lived there uh, about six years almost. We lived there back and forth. And then we were there when COVID hit, and they said, you need to leave. And uh, we didn't plan on leaving right away, but then they said, you better get out now. So we left got to Hong Kong and then they said, you better leave Hong Kong. And then we thought, well, what's going to happen? They shut down the trains from mainland to Hong Kong. And then United Airlines said, you better leave because we got one more flight going out. So we made it back to San Francisco in February. Sorry. <laughs> I get a little emotional because we watched these videos. I hadn't seen it in a while and I just remember that was our church, and uh, since COVID, you know, everything had shut down, and we lost that building, and now we're meeting back in hotels. So it's been kind of a rough transition, but God is good. The church is growing, and uh, actually, it's, it's, it's we yeah, we got a couple pictures. Let's go ahead and show those. I normally don't get all emotional, but I haven't seen that video in a while, and that's like, kind of takes yeah. me back. So these are our leaders. Yeah, this is our leaders. Yeah. They're, me they're meeting in a kindergarten school. Um, and then this morning, because they're already night there, they're 12 hours ahead, but this morning they had two salvations in the hotel Amen. where they're meeting. Yeah. Amen. That's the next, yeah, right there. So. What's, what's neat about this is we needed a place, and it's like, We've had to move several times. Since 18, uh, the, we went into the mainland, and they said, we need to take facial recognitions and your handprints now before we let you in. So that was in 18. Everything went, started going nuts. So at that point, you know, we've had to move several times. And at one time, you'll like this, Pastor. At one time, we didn't have a place to meet. So we f found on the street, one, we had a pastor there that we had in charge from England. When we couldn't be there, he monitored and, and kept the church going. And then you know, we ended up in an Irish pub on Sundays to meet because, you know, they already had everything set up. They had the PA and the, and the karaoke or whatever, so we could, we could use that. But we thought, who's going to fire in this in an Irish pub on a Sunday afternoon in China? So the church kept growing. We kept moving. We, we didn't break God's law, but we bent their laws a lot of times, so we're not worried about that. But we, we made it out. We went, we've been actually back twice since... Since this year, we went back twice early in the year, and we just came back from there. But tell them about the pub, what ended up happening to Oh, them. yeah, the, the pub ended up sh shutting down, so <laughs> sorry. I, about, I guess we brought too about much that. anointing yeah. in So it, anyway, we got back to a hotel. This is a cool hotel because there's like multiple churches that are meeting this hotel at all for different times on Sunday, and it's in southern China near Guangzhou, and it's like... They, hide, they don't say anything because, you know, they like to get the revenue, of course, of each, each week. But they'll have, I don't know how many churches meet in this building on Sundays, but it's amazing. But God's what's doing. And it's, it can't shut down the church. I mean, you can't shut down the people. They'll meet in their house. They'll meet in a park. 
It doesn't matter. I mean, what, whatever happens, it's it. You know, God's in control. But, but anyway, good to be back here. First time here, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Hoosier. I was born in Richmond, so go Hoosiers. So anyway, <laughs> be back home a little bit. But we got home Wednesday. We had 14 flights. I was telling the pastor in six countries in three weeks. And then we're home till Thursday, and then we go to Israel. So real quick, uh, we have a table back there. We have some T-shirts. You can stop, say hello. We want to shake your hand, hug, fist bump, whatever you all do. And we have a QR code you can scan for our Facebook. If you want to keep up on the ministry, we do live. Uh, so we'll be doing live. I'm doing the camera behind the scenes, and I'm watching my back to make sure nothing's coming up on me. So I'm kind of security and cameraman at the same time. But uh, if you want to see the ministry and what's going on, Facebook's the best way for us. You know, we don't put a whole lot on there, especially in China, but we really just watch what we do and say, but mainly for the people that are left behind that are there now, you know, still putting up with it. But God's good, and it's good to be with you all. Amen. Your, your song list this morning began to sing, How Great Thou Art, and that was the song on our first trip into China. I've got a long story, I won't get into it, but the Holy Spirit had called me into a three-by-five prayer room. I prayed 21 years for nations, not looking to go, but then after 21 years, he said, it's time to go. And so Tara and I began, God began sovereignly, open doors. We didn't have a missions group. We didn't have no one in those countries, but God began opening them up. But I'll never forget being on trains, planes, automobiles, ships, whatever, getting into mainland. And the whole way there, I would play How Great Thou Art. And so whenever I hear that song, it reminds me of the first time. I'm going in to China. And so we're grateful. Thank you for your love, prayers, and support. But I'm here today to see what the Holy Spirit would say to each of you. So can we pray? Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you. God, I thank you that you are great. And you are greatly to be praised. Holy Spirit, as you hovered over the face of the earth when it was dark and it was chaotic, I invite the hovering presence of Holy Spirit. For I know there are people and situations in this room that is dark and that is chaotic. But just like Genesis 1-2 says, the earth was dark, it was without form, and Holy Spirit began to hover, and Father began to speak. And he spoke, let there be light. And I just declare your light, the entrance of your word, bringing light to every dark situation in this room right now, Father, be it mental, be it spiritual, be it physical. And then Holy Spirit, as we see you there, when Mary was sitting in that room, a virgin girl, and the angel appeared and said, Mary, you are with child. And she said, how can this be? I don't know a man. Well, I come from Ohio. I come from the state where our motto is with God, all things are possible. And that's the angel spoke and said, Mary, with God, it, with man, it's impossible. But with God, it's possible. I speak to every impossible situation in this room. And I say, turn our eyes upon Jesus. Let's look to him, the author and finisher of our faith. Let it be as the angel told Mary. Mary, the highest one will overshadow you and you you will conceive. I declare a conception of the word of God into every impossible situation in this room. And then Holy Spirit, as we see you in the book of Acts where they had gathered, they were all there with one mind and with one accord. I ask for these next moments that our mind come under subjection, that our mind come under obedience to the Holy Spirit and his word so that no one leaves here like they came in Jesus' name, amen and amen. And so I'm in here. I declare the blood of Jesus over every one of us. We also, I'm going back to your song list. We also begin to sing of the blood of Jesus. Can I tell you, as a little girl, before I even knew how to spell the blood, I had a mama who taught me how to plead the blood. And I know in a modern day church, they say, oh, pleading is old fashioned, but excuse me, no, pleading.
plead is a legal term. If I stand before a judge, I'm going to plead guilty or I'm going to plead innocent. Well, I'm not innocent because of what the cross did for me, but I'm not guilty because of the blood of Jesus. And so I plead the blood of Jesus. Amen. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. How many times, whether we're in China, whether we're in India, whether we're in Israel, whether we're in Europe, and it can be the highest mountain or it can be the lowest valley. And I have found the strength in the blood of Jesus. Amen. I believe it's Exodus. If we want to turn there for a moment and let's look at Exodus where we know the story. It's what will be with the Jewish people next week. Well, here this week, Thursday, we fly out and the Jewish people, if you ask them what was their greatest deliverance, they're going to tell you the exodus when, when the blood, you know, was put over the doorpost. And, and that was their deliverance. But we know our greatest deliverance came when the true Lamb of God was slain. And the blood comes over the doorpost of our life. Amen. But Exodus 12, verse 13. Well, I'll go up to verse 12. Well, I'll pass through the land of Egypt on that night. And I'll strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. But verse 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the house where you are. And when I, come on, say, when I see the blood, I will pass over and the plague will not be on you to destroy when I strike the land of Egypt. We're thankful for Psalm 91 that says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He goes on to say, No plague will come nigh you. Can I tell you, we are in a society where plagues are everywhere. And I'm not just talking about COVID. There are plagues mentally. There are plagues physically. There are plagues in this world. And I'm not here to make anyone afraid. But I'm going to tell you that Isaiah 60 says that gross darkness is going to cover the people. Darkness is going to cover the earth. But it's not a time to run and hide. Isaiah 60 says, arise and shine. Amen. For the glory has risen upon you. I felt impressed upon my spirit as they began to sing about the blood. That it's time that we really realize the power of the blood. Because for too long, again, I, I was born, I'm, I'll be 61 this month, and, and I was grown and born in a church where we knew the power of the blood. Again, my mom would plead the blood of Jesus over us before we got into a vehicle, before we got into a car, before we went to school. Before She always kept the blood over us. It was never ritual. She didn't do it out of habit, but she knew the power of the blood of Jesus, and I'm so grateful for that, that I would grow up knowing how to plead the blood. But it would be in my late 20s, early 30s that I would myself be taken into a wilderness. I didn't know then. If you would have told me then, it was nowhere on the radar that we would have churches in the underground China, that we would go to Israel, we'd go to India, we'd go to all of these nations to proclaim the gospel and to bring the love of Jesus. But in that season, when God was preparing and molding me for those nations, I myself went through a wilderness like I had never even knew existed upon the earth where even me as a little girl being raised in church and knowing the Bible and prayer first resort and never a last me having healings I, I, my, my first healing I was five years old and, and and my mom you know back then they didn't have the internet they had a radio that sat beside their bed and my mom would always have Christian radio she would she would have the preachers on there preaching and, and there was some man named A.A. A. Allen, along with Oral Roberts in them, that would have tent meetings, and, and they would pray for the sick, and, and my mom was cleaning that day, and she left me on that bed so sick, I, I couldn't, we, we didn't have money, we were very poor, I'm from a family of 12, you know, they believed in cheaper by the dozen, but it wasn't, we were poor, but we were rich in God, we were rich in love, I talk a lot about my mom and my Arise and Thresh prayer book, where Holy Spirit was teaching me strategies 
on how to pray. But in that season, I was only five, and my mom was cleaning. I remember the day clearly. You know, it's like, how do you remember when you were five years old? Because when you have an encounter with Jesus, whether you're 5, 50, or 105, you will never, ever forget it. And so at that time, I remember being so sick and just laying on the bed, high fever and just lifeless. I, I don't know. Again, I don't know what was wrong with me. We didn't go to the doctor, but all I know is my mom had great faith in Dr. Jesus. Amen. And so she prayed for me and she went about cleaning and she had her radio on. And I began, that little girl began to listen to that man that was on there preaching that day. And he got to the end pastor and he said, if there's anyone out there sick in Radio land, right? They called it radio land back then. He said, just, I want you to just put your hand forward and touch this radio while I pray and you're going to be healed. Now that little girl inside of me heard that truth and, and it's an act of faith. I just, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew that my mom had taught me enough. I knew that radio wasn't going to heal me no more than the woman said if I could touch his garment. It wasn't the garment. Jesus said, it's your faith that makes you whole. And that little girl and me stretched forth and I laid my hands on the radio. And the next thing I knew, I was jumping and I ran through that room and my mom looked like she had seen a ghost and she said, oh, what happened? You know, and I told her, I said, he said, if I touched the radio while he prayed, I'm going to be healed. So I knew that I knew Jesus healed. It brought me to be 36 when it was a generational uh, cancer that my grandma had died from, that my mom and two sisters had major surgeries to take care of. And now I'm 36 and I'm being diagnosed it with it. But I told my doctor, if he was here, he would verify all this, Dr. Aram. I said, Dr. Aram, I said, my Abba, my daddy will take care of me. And his last words to me after all the tests and results, and it had fell out of my body, he said, don't you ever forget, Abba will always take care of you. And so to God be the glory, I know the healings. I knew all of this, and, and I taught Sunday school since I was 12 years old. And as pastor mentioned, I've grown up in a church that was strong on the word of God and taught us that, you know, this isn't just something, you know, that preachers scream out and spit all over, but no, the, it's, it's the sword and it's the word of God. And, but now I'm in a wilderness and I'm going through a season where I was plagued with the spirit of fear that it came upon me, that paralyzed me, that for 10 months, I couldn't minister. I couldn't drive a car. I couldn't take care of our babies. I could not do anything. I'm not talking about being afraid. I'm talking about a spirit of fear, and that would be in the late 80s, early 90s, and I, so I walked through that journey, and I learned that this was the air I breathed, this was my daily bread, and I began to consume it until it consumed everything that was inside of me, but I'll never forget that I was in the midst of that intense battle, and, and I, I began to have a vision one day, and listen, let me just, let me just put this out there, visions and dreams, they are reality, a third of that Bible is either a vision or a dream that a prophet or a man of God would have. And so in this dream, or I wasn't in a dream, I was awake. I was about my day and, and I began to have a vision. And I seen what looked like a large waterfall, but it was of blood. It wasn't of water. And, and when I first seen it, my thought was, you know, and I'm seeing it like I'm seeing y'all right now. It wasn't like I was caught up in some realm and, you know, out somewhere. No, I, I it was in my daily walk that I would see this. And, of course, going back to a little girl, I knew, okay, that's the blood of Jesus. And, and so I'm going to plead the blood. And I did. I mean, it was like I had never had to have a vision of the blood to plead the blood. I, I knew it. I knew the power of pleading the blood. But but that day I began to begin to see this and I and I said, God, I, I plead your blood right now. I pleaded I pleaded over my family. I, I pleaded over her vehicles, and it would not leave. I kept having this vision, and, and I'm troubled inside thinking, why am I seeing this? Is, is this something dangerous? Is this something like, you know, like are you warning me of something get ready to happen, and I need to go? And so I, I not again, not out of habit, not out of ritual, but I kept pleading the blood for three days, three days, and it didn't leave. And I didn't know anything. All I would see, it was like this waterfall. 
But on the third day, I seen where it was coming from. And it was coming from his brow. I had, I'm sure my mom had pictures as a little girl that I had seen of, of the cross and of, of Jesus. And we've all seen them where the thorns are piercing his brow and we see the blood maybe trickle down. I think the greatest illustration we had at that point up to then was the passion movie with Mel Gibson where he, I, to this day, if I, if that movie was on, I would not be able to watch the crucifixion. I would not be able to watch that part where they're just beating him. I have to turn my head, but even that did not compare with the blood I watched pour from his head that day. And that day, again, up to that day, I knew by his stripes I'm healed. I knew he was wounded. The bruising inside was the, plain, the pain and the blood inside was for iniquitous patterns, bloodlines, sins of the blood, sins of the fathers and the grandfathers. I knew he was wounded for my transgression. I knew that was sins I'd committed, but I had never really seen the part of the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And at that, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, I did that for your peace of mind. Don't you allow Satan to take your peace. I paid the ultimate price. I put the blood over the doorpost of your mind so the death angel could not cross. And he began to teach me that day from, from now on when that battle and that fear and all of that comes to your mind, I want you to buy faith because showing the blood of goats and lambs stopped the death angel. How much greater the blood of Jesus when applied in faith. And so I begin to plead the blood over the door of my mind and know the battle battle didn't stop immediately, but, but the battle got less and less. And here's what happened with the blood over the mind. It put a barrier. Satan could not cross the bloodline. And so when the thoughts come, when the attack of the mind came, it met the blood before it met my emotions. And it gave me the authority of Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 that says we are in the flesh, but that's not how we war. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and what the blood over the mind did. And I'm telling you this for a reason. I'll get to it. But putting the blood over the doorpost of my mind. And I begin that day when the battle intensified and the fear was just a mockery constant. I begin to say, Jesus, I plead the blood over my mind. I put it over the door of my mind. And from that day forward, anything that tried to get into my mind got met with the blood of Jesus. And how many know Satan cannot cross the bloodline, whether it's for your salvation, whether it's for your protection, or whether it's for your mind like it was then. And the reason and I'm saying that because Terry spoke and, and talked about when we were in January 2020, when we were in China and COVID broke out and little, no one knew, no one knew, no one knew that that sickness was going to come and plague the world like we have watched it do for three years. But that day, the calls started coming in. That morning was our normal Saturday morning. That last picture on that video showed me in a park. That's my favorite park in Dongqing, Dongguan, China. And in that park where I would go and pray and we would walk that park and, and we we would go there and pray in the mornings. And that morning, I knew it's Saturday morning, we're going to pray. And we're really going to pray because it's Chinese New Year. And so there's a lot. Chinese is, is more than 60, 80% atheism, but there's about 10% Buddhism. And in that community we're in, they, they light their, all of their incense and they let off all the fireworks and it's to Buddha. And I thought that morning, I thought, Lord, Today, I want it to be sunshine. I want it to be so, so sunny because uh, just backstory on that. When they are celebrating Chinese New Year, they're, they'll spend millions of dollars for all of their celebration, but they want it to rain. Now, how many knows if it's 4th of July, we don't want rain, right? But they want rain because they feel that it's their gods answering them by rain with an open heaven. And so... They, they love it if it's raining. They want it for days. They want it to be cloudy. They want it to be cold. And they want it to be pouring the rain. And so not knowing about COVID yet, I said, Lord, 
let the sun come out. Like Malachi 4 says, the sun will rise with healing in his wings. I said, let there be so much sunshine today. So Tay and I woke up that morning, and guess what? The sun is so bright. It's like so bright. I'm like, yes. And so we start walking to the park, and we get near the park, and there's all these police officers and streets blocked in with all these barricades. And we're like, I wonder what's going on. We had no idea. And then uh, the closer we got to the park, we realized that high mountain where the temple is, they were blocking it. And I'm like, yes, not only did he bring sunshine, but he is, something's happened and they can't go up and worship Buddha today. So I said, we're going to just worship Jesus even louder. It's like, you know, Elijah before Baal and you call down your fire and we'll call down our fire. The God that answers by fire win. Well, it was our God winning that day, answering by fire. But by the time we got back, again, not knowing what was going on, they stopped us. But I said, no, no, I'm not going up there. I'm going to walk, you know, to jog. And so the police let us in the park. And so we got to walk and pray. By the time we got back, we had uh, our translator call us and say, you got to leave China. I said, what? Please find us. <laughs> nope. There's a, she called it a virus. There's something going on. It's really bad and you need to get out. And I'm like, oh, we can't, you know, we got services Sunday. This was Saturday and next week, you know, cause she's heading, don't go to Hong Kong because she knows we're going to do ministry in there next week. And she said, go home, get to America. Sue, you got to get out fast. I'm like, oh no, I can't leave. I'll, I'll wait till I finish ministering and we'll keep our plan and then we'll leave. And so she said, no, get out now. So I said, well, after church. So we had church service um, on Sunday. And then like Tara said, we took the train and got out. But when we walked, when she told us what was happening, and we walked out into that atmosphere, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said that what I showed you three decades ago, back in the late 80s, is now what's come on the earth. Because when he had me identify with all that fear, and knowing truly, even though I'd been taught it, it became full revelation to me of the power of the blood of Jesus. And knowing in this season that the modern day church don't even sing songs about the blood anymore. I'm thankful that Corey and Carrie Job, they just wrote and released a new song on I Plead the Blood. And I'm like shouting. I played it in China. I played it in the Philippines. It's like finally a song that literally says I plead the blood. And it's with the modern day worshipers right now. But anyway, we walked out in that atmosphere. And the Holy Spirit said this, what he told me back in the 90s, early 90s, he said in the last days. How many can agree? We are in the last of the last days. And he said that fear is going to paralyze the world. And when Tara and I walked out in that atmosphere that morning, he said, this is that. You know how Acts says when they got filled with the Holy Ghost and Peter stands up and says, this is that, that Joel prophesied about. Can I tell you, this is that, that the Holy Spirit told me three decades ago was coming upon the earth. And from children to adults, they would be plagued with fear. And he said, this is a plague, this COVID thing. We didn't, it didn't have a name yet. He said, this sickness is a plague and it's going to paralyze the world with fear. It was Satan's last attempt because Revelations 12, 12 says, when Satan knows his time is short, he pours out great wrath for you individually that is going through something and it seems all hell has broke loose and how much worse can it get? You can know you are right on the brink of your victory because when he knows he's got a short time, he pours out great wrath. So you say, what do I do? Well, you're here. You told me everything that's here. So what do we do? You keep the blood over your mind. And a prayer I'm going to pray with you as I close and go to 2 Kings chapter 6 real quick to capsule story because this is what the Holy Spirit has said. I, I, I don't know. Maybe on the next service I'll talk more about angels. Y'all like, what's this pastor? Doug bringing us a lady that's talking about vision streams and angels. Hey, I'm not talking about feminine weirdo angels that Hollywood portrays or the fat cherubim babies that some churches display. But I'm talking about Psalm 91 11. He gives his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Psalm 34 7. 
the angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear God and that are called according to his purpose. Can I tell you, have we not had angels? And have not they increased? Hey, they announced Jesus' birth, right? And Revelation tells us they're going to come and they're going to gather the harvest. But I'm talking about angels that are with each one of us, protecting us. And until you see them, you're going to be filled with fear on what's coming up on this earth. But 2 Kings chapter 6, I'm not going to the whole story. I'm just going to pull out the scripture because we know what's happening here. The king of Syria is making war against Israel, and that war continues to this day. Amen? And so he's telling them, okay, here's my camp's going to be, and we're going to attack Israel. But every time they come to that place to attack Israel, Israel's gone. And finally, the king is so upset, he gets all of his servants together, and he says, okay, one of you, I'm in verse 11 of 2 Kings 6, he said, um, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me which one of you is for the king of Israel? I mean, okay, the king realizes, okay, somebody is telling my battle plans. Every time I go to attack Israel, they're gone. So one of you is leaking my strategy. Can you imagine how scared all of them were? And then finally in verse 12, one of his servants said, none, my Lord, O king, but it's Elisha, the prophet. He's in Israel. He tells the king of Israel the words you speak in your bedroom. And so and I says, okay, go see where he's at. I'm coming after him. The Holy Spirit is laying this upon my heart because someone in this room, probably more than one, is surrounded by an army. And I'm not talking a physical army, but again, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, that's not how we wore Ephesians 6. We've got on an armor. we got to engage in the battle spiritually, right? And so they sent horses and chariots. A great army came there by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early, he went out. He seen it all surrounding. And he came back. And in verse 15, I won't scream, but he sings, Alas, my master. In other words, our modern-day terminology, he freaked out. Because here's Gehazi going outside of the tent that morning where it's just him and Elisha. What in the Israel army? It's just him and Elisha and Dauphin. And they go out and they see this whole army. Gehazi does. The whole army is surrounded full. Look at that. Surrounding the chariot, city with horses and chariots. And a servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Hey, these sound people are good because I didn't give you guys no scripture. Pastor said, do you have scriptures? I said, no, Holy Spirit hadn't told me. I didn't tell him that, but uh, Terry will send them Sunday. I didn't have anything. I don't know till I get up here, right? And so he's like, what shall we do? Like he's screaming. And I love this because this is the place being filled with the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being prayers that are word-fed prayers will always build your spirit that no matter what you face, you won't react, you will respond. And so he responded, the prophet responded and said, do not fear. Gehazi is not a prophet. Thank God he got to be with the prophet because he got the prophet's protection. But he said, don't fear. Those with us are more than those that are with them. Now, come on. Gehazi is human like us. So I'm sure, you know, it's like the disciples so often would be like, uh, Jesus, you know, like, you know. So here's Gehazi, and he's probably thinking, um, those with us more than those with them. Uh, Elisha, you know, we don't have Israel's army here with us. It's just me and you. How is there more with us than with them? But then Elisha tells him, and he prays. He prays. He didn't pray for God to remove the army, to remove the fight. No, he, what did he pray? God, open his eyes. Let him see. Can I tell you, more than this eyesight, you need spiritual eyesight. The spirit world is far more real than this physical world. And we've got to a place that Hebrews 12, 26 begins to tell us. And he begins to say, that once more, 
I shake not only the earth, but the heavens. See, the battle is so intense right now in the spirit world because, again, we're in the last of the last days. And that's what I'm telling you. You need to know how to keep the blood over your mind, over your life. And yes, as Pastor said a little bit ago, if anyone in here has not yet committed your life to Jesus, I tell you, don't wait till tomorrow. Do it now because Jesus is coming soon. And I hear and I proclaim that around the world. People might say like the scoffers did in the Bible oh I've heard it my whole life I've heard Jesus is coming yeah but you know how we get in and out of China now with a QR code we're really close really close and more than that someone in this room could even be closer because you're going to face Jesus and again I'm not trying to scare nobody but last May we had a two-week turned 13-year-old granddaughter that had been healthy in her whole life. Nothing ever wrong. Make a long story short, that day we ended up air caring, air flighting her to Children's Hospital because she had a brain rupture that literally she was dead. I mean, like literally we're looking. I watched and looked at death over our granddaughter. And was filled with the knowledge and even surgeon, the top surgeon, top three renowned surgeon in the world telling us she's either going to die or live. And if she lives, it's going to be a long process. She's going to have to learn to walk, talk, eat, everything again. Well, within six weeks, Hannah walked out of that hospital and is alive and well today. Amen. But I, I'm going to bring this in here if I've got enough time. I don't see a clock or anything, Pastor. So... But just last night, she texted me the, the morning she woke up, Saturday morning, and said, Mimi, she said, I need to tell you my dream. This, now she's 14 years old. She said, I had a dream, and I was walking down a long, beautiful path, and the sun was so bright. And she said, as I started walking down this path, thank you, put up the clock there. As I started walking down this path, she said, I, I seen a, a gazebo, a beautiful gazebo, but it had a stairway, a long stairway, and I knew that stairway was going into heaven, and so I began to pray because Hannah faced death. I mean, she was here this morning. She literally faced death. We had miracle after miracle with Hannah. It cut her whole head open, took her skull out, over 150 stitches, took that skull out, I mean, gave the time. I mean, three major surgeries this little girl had. She has no fear. She, she was ready to meet Jesus then, and she's more ready to meet him now. But she told me in the dream that she stood in front of that stairway, and she knew it was God calling her and that she was going to go to heaven. So she said, I started praying. I started making declarations. I'm just declaring God's word, and, and I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm going to meet Jesus. And she said, as I started to walk up to meet Jesus, she said, a man came. And he had weapons, and he had other things. And he, and he started telling me, no, this is how we get into heaven. And he started, like, breaking things and doing things with these weapons. She said, but then instantly, this, she didn't call him a messenger, but I told her it was a messenger. This other person came. And they said, no. And then they ran and told God what that man was trying to do. And then he stopped them, and she woke up. I said, Hannah Sue, you know what that is? You know there's only one way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus. And, and your prayer and dedication to him and, and making yourself ready to meet him. Man's going to come, and man has come and said, oh, there's a lot of ways, or we can do it ourselves. If I'm good, if I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'll get to heaven. But thank God for his grace that even to that person that is in deception, God's going to bring truth to them. And it might just be through your own mouth, Hannah Sue. And so we're in that day. And time is short. It's running out. But we need to know the power of the blood of Jesus, first and foremost, for salvation. I, I haven't got yet to tell Pastor Doug Combs this and, and Tim Delaney, but we know Pastor Doug. And I don't know if y'all do it here and Tim Delaney, but when they're ready to make the altar call, you know, they, they say it's the ABCs, right? Admit you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died and, and, you know, saved you and that you can be born again. And see, confess. 
we were just in Hong Kong and we were with some college age um, Chinese that didn't know Jesus and, and even had two Muslims uh, from Palestine. And, and so I'm, the lady brings me to the office and said, I want you to present the gospel to them and, and just see if, you know, they'll accept Jesus. And so I'm there. I've got this whole message. And then the two Chinese college young men said, we want, we're, we're ready. We want to be saved. And so I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I said, you know, in America, we have our, uh, thank God we're not in China. They have thousands of characters. I said, we only have 26 letters and it's A, B, C. And, and even the young college guy, he knew it. He could speak English well. He began to say A, B, C, D. I said, okay, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Prayer, and it's the ABCs of the gospel. So I went over, I said, admit you're a sinner, believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth. So he said, okay. And then he said, what's D? Like he was ready for D. Like he wanted to go through the whole alphabet. I can't wait to tell Pastor Doug that. But he, he, yeah, he said, what's D? Like what's next? What can I do next? And so, yeah, it's, it's about salvation. And thank God it's only through the blood of of Jesus. Again, he was wounded for our transgressions. Wounded is a, a bleeding on the inside. He was, he was bruised for even the sins of our father's father. He was wounded for our transgressions, right? The chastisement for our peace of mind. I want everyone in here because I know they call us, they call this society, the anxiety society. That is full of fear. And it's not just COVID. COVID magnified it. COVID just put it to a whole other level. But when you have the blood over your mind and you're aware of the angelic protection around you, you will not have fear. It will be just like this. Elijah did not fear. He said, God, open his eyes. And I'm sure Kehasi, I was thinking, oh, my eyes are open. I can see clearly now, right? No, it's your eyes, Elijah. You need to go out there and look. But when Elijah sent him back out, he said, now look. See, because we always look this way. We're looking at our problem, our situation. And David said, I'll look to the hills where my help comes from. Amen. Can we all stand? And pastor, I don't know how we do this. If you come up or you want to pray and. I'm going to come up, but I'm going to ask you to pray. Okay, I'll pray. Can you I'll do pray. that? Will you yes. Do, yeah, yes. You and Terry. What we're going to do, the worship team comes. Um, I want to ask Sue and Terry to pray for folks. I This was a phenomenal word, folks. I, I'm sure you heard the depth there. Yes. And so she's hitting, because she's allowing the Holy Spirit to lead her, she's hitting a nerve. I know as well that there are folks in this room that you are. You struggle with mind battles. You struggle with fear. You struggle with anxiety. Maybe you have sickness. You know, you can tell that God uses Sue and Terry and, and, and a multitude of ministries as, as would be expected for them going across the nations. And so we've got plenty of time, and we're going to do something. We don't always do it here, but we believe in the power of laying hands on the sick. We believe in the power of laying hands on people, pleading the blood. Amen. How many just say amen to what we heard? And so, so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to, we're going to ask them to come up and they're going to pray for you. If you, especially if you're struggling with, with a mind battle, if you're struggling with anxiety or depression or fear on any level, we're just going to ask Sue to lay hands on you and Terry and to pray for you. And we're going to believe God to intervene today. And you're going to leave this place free. Amen. Let me do this corporately because I know without asking for a show of hands. If I come and I speak something, it's what the Holy Spirit is letting me know that's there. Isaiah 55, 11 says, the word won't return yes. void, Amen. but it will accomplish what it was sent to do. The word is our sword. Psalm 103, 20 says, angels hasten to perform the word of God when it goes forth. So here's what I wanna do corporately. And then yes, individually, we will lay hands on the sick, We'll, whatever the prayer needs, we'll come into agreement. But corporately, because I feel it applies. I'm sure at, you've all identified with fear at some level. Yeah. But then there's that spirit of fear. That 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul says, I didn't give you a spirit of fear. Yeah. 
And so when you have a spirit of fear, again, not just being afraid. I mean, we all got to be afraid to walk out in front of traffic. But when you have a spirit of fear that keeps you up at night, that keeps you paralyzed, that keeps that heart beating so fast, here's the word I'm going to release. Isaiah 54 talks about, we all quote that, no weapon formed against you will prosper. But the prior verses, verse 14 says, when you are established in righteousness, everyone in here this room, if you're not established in righteousness, you can be the first up here and get that. But he says, if you are established in righteousness, you will be far from oppression. You won't fear and terror won't come nigh you. And somebody say, but wait a minute, I am established in my, so was I. When I was 29, I was established as much as I could be in righteousness. But I wasn't far from oppression. It kept me in a bed of affliction. I did fear. I couldn't even drive a car. I couldn't take care of my babies. Again, he said, you'll be far from oppression. You won't fear and terror will not come nigh you. Terror was my next door neighbor. It talked to me 24-7. It kept me up at night. I was established in righteousness. And he goes on to say, indeed, verse 15, they do rise up against you. What rises up? Fear, oppression, and terror? It says, but when they do, your heritage as a child of God is you can condemn it. You can rebuke it. And then he says, because no weapon form will prosper. Yeah. So what weapon is forming right now? We're going to pray right now corporately. Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. First of all, I plead the blood of Jesus yes. over everyone in this room. I plead the blood over their minds, the doorposts of the entry point of every lie and deception and oppression that the enemy seeks to bring to them. I cover their minds with the blood of Jesus. And then I address the spirit of fear that comes to torment, that comes to paralyze, to come to keep them from going forth into what God has called them. And not just that, but it keeps some of them in a bed of affliction. It keeps some of them paralyzed at night. But through the authority of Jesus Christ, I command the spirit of fear Hallelujah. to lose its hold Hallelujah. now. Hallelujah. To lose its hold now. Praise God. And those who have not been able to sleep at night. Come on. David said you will lie down Jesus. and your sleep shall be sweet yes. for he gives his beloved sleep i cover yes. everyone while they sleep at night no more torment no more harassment of the enemy but they'll have angelic encounters david said my heart and spirit will counsel me in the night seasons i speak a counseling of holy spirit i also sense in my spirit right now there's at least four marriages that have been under a demonic attack of hell and listen i know marriages have problems i know our son went through divorce. i know things happen but this I'm, again i'm not talking in the natural i'm not talking about just i'm talking about a hidden attack of hell to destroy families we had it happen to our, our leader in China but praise God God restored and healed that marriage and now they're going strong and I declare I ask God to insulate every home and protect every Hallelujah. marriage and we go to the very root of this situation in this marriage and we curse it at the root and we speak abundant, we speak a restoration of the first love in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, make sure you like and share on social media to help spread God's word. If you'd like to learn more about The Bridge, or if you'd like to give, you can go to our website at thebridge129.org. Again, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.